Good afternoon and welcome to those of you who've just joined us. My name is Laura Stebbing. I'm co-CEO of Accelerate Hair, an organization focused on addressing the underrepresentation of women in the tech industry. I'm responsible for the event today and I'm tremendously excited to introduce the discussion between three incredibly successful women, Cherie Blair, Hillary Clinton and Dame Vivian Hunt. It's fair to say this is a bit of a dream come true for me. On a personal level, I spent five years working for Cherie at her Foundation for Women and was able to see firsthand just how hugely driven she is to change the world for women in our lifetime. She really is an amazing mentor to me. Similarly, Cherie saw Secretary Clinton as a real mentor when her, when her husband, Tony Blair, first started in office, and I've always wanted to bring the two of them together on stage, albeit in the cloud, to talk about their friendship and passion for equality for women. Who better to moderate a discussion of this nature than Dame Vivian? Dame Vivian Hunt is the managing partner for McKinsey and Company in the UK and Ireland. Dame Vivian is chair of Teach First, chair of British American Business, and a board member of the British Museum. She is co-author of McKinsey's most influential publications across the topics of future of work, productivity and skills, and inclusion and diversity. Dame Vivian, I am delighted to hand over the next 60 minutes to you. Thank you, Laura, for your very warm and kind introduction. And I want to welcome all of you. Um, I know many of you, including myself, have been awaiting this session. And I know it will be an insightful, challenging, and relevant conversation and an extraordinary time for our world. It is very humbling to moderate a discussion between two extraordinary women, each of whom, for most of you, needs no introduction. But Secretary Clinton and Mrs. Blair, for our wide global and virtual audience, I will try to do my best. Secretary Hillary Clinton started her career as a lawyer and then an educator as a law professor. She served as First Lady of the State of Arkansas, First Lady of the United States, State Senator of New York, Secretary of State under the Obama administration, and of course, Democratic nominee for president in 2016. You are an advocate and an activist for human rights and women's rights throughout your political life and serve many organizations including the Clinton Foundation and Onward Together, just to name two. Mrs. Blair is also a woman of the law. She started her professional life as a lawyer and she was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1995. She served as the British First Lady for 10 years. She founded Omnia Strategy, an international boutique law firm and the Cherie Blair Foundation for Women. She is Chancellor of the Asian University for Women and of course, a board member of Accelerate Her, one of our hosts today. Secretary Clinton, Mrs. Blair, there is that symmetry in your background of starting with the legal profession and um, really a shared mission and purpose for human rights, women rights, and I would say service, public service. And I also know that the two of you are both mothers and grandmothers. You're friends and have connected in the past and we'll come back to that a little bit later in our discussion today, but it is really our privilege to welcome you to the conversation. We need to start where the world is, which is trying to make sense of what our next steps are in this COVID-19 um, crisis, the health crisis that it has presented literally to every human and every household in the world, the economic uh, recovery that we now have to build together. And in the last few weeks, yet another cry for justice and somehow addressing the um, civil and human uh, injustices that we see in the uh, murder of George Floyd and the response right around the world. So Secretary Clinton, if you don't mind, I'm gonna start with a simple question. How are you doing? Well, Vivian, thank you so much for moderating this discussion um, with Cherie and myself. And of course, that's the first question we all ask each other. Uh, I just had a few minutes with Cherie and met two of her adorable grandchildren virtually. <laughs> and how are you doing uh, is uh, a question that I think covers the entire uh, range of the issues that you just uh, addressed. How are we doing 
health-wise, well, we've been very fortunate in my family to be able to quarantine together along with my daughter, her husband, and our grandchildren, um, and to stay safe and to try to do what we can uh, to help with the uh, terrible burden, particularly in New York, which is the epicenter of the virus here in America, uh, doing everything from helping to uh, fund uh, food delivery uh, because people are going hungry, uh, working with elected officials to get their messages out because some people still refuse to follow public health directions and so much more. With respect to the economic crisis uh, that has certainly come upon us because of the necessary public health measures, uh, that's going to be with us for some time. And we're going to do everything we can in our country to try to institute uh, bottom up, not top down economic recovery, to provide uh, support for the people who have lost their jobs, lost their incomes, because sadly, uh, some will not get those jobs back. And some will be facing the dilemma of paying for food or rent, uh, meeting a mortgage payment, trying to keep themselves afloat. And then, of course, very tragically, but importantly, we are once again grappling with the legacy uh, and the ongoing injustice of systemic racism in America. But this feels different, Vivian. I hope it is. It feels like for many people, this is truly uh, a consciousness raising moment that many of the other uh, abuses and tragedies and brutalities didn't have the impact that seeing on our video screens the suffocation of a human being, almost in total, reckless, intentional even, disregard of his humanity has had. So there are changes happening. Legislatures are beginning to pass significant reforms in the way that police are supposed to function. We are looking at a suite of legislation introduced in the Congress by the House of Representatives led by Nancy Pelosi. Um, so I hope both uh, in substantive ways, such as legislation and regulation and accountability within the judicial system uh, for such acts, as we have seen, uh, we are also hopefully seeing a turning point in uh, recognizing bias and the role that it plays in people's lives, despite uh, many of us being unwilling to recognize or admit that. So yes, it's a very, uh, it's a very profound uh, moment uh, in the United States, and I, I think, as you rightly say, around the world. We've we've seen that impact in the UK as well, um, uh, Cherie, and and I wonder how it's felt from your perspective, look, thinking about the UK and more globally, both you know personally as well as the the broader um, society impact. Well, sure. I mean. Like Hillary, I've also been fortunate to, to have our own little bubble, as, as Hillary said, with our, our son, daughter-in-law, and our two of our three existing grandchildren, with another two coming shortly. Um, and so, uh, in one way, it's been an amazing uh, family time together. Um, but at the same time, in many ways, it hasn't been that different for me, uh, because throughout my career, I've used a lot of technology in order to uh, continue with my work. As the, the, the first spouse of a prime minister who carried on as a full-time job as, as a barrister, I wasn't able to do that without technology. So I'm quite used to using technology. And so as it happens, um, I've certainly done a lot more. I can't believe that how many Zoom uh, meetings I've done, uh, but that, is, uh, that has enabled me, I'm so fortunate to continue my business and of course my foundation, the aim of my foundation is to use technology to help women in low and middle income countries uh, get the tools that they need to grow and expand their businesses, whether that's through uh, learning tools, through networking and mentoring. And my foundation has been very lucky we've been able to pivot using technology and what we've been concentrating on is making sure that we make our resources available to as many 
women entrepreneurs as possible. So we've been really focused on that and that's kept us uh, pretty busy. As far as what, what has happened in, in, in the world more generally, uh, we obviously uh, have seen the repercussions of that here in the UK. Uh, and, and for me, I think it's, it's been a, a strange thing because I've been a human rights lawyer. I've, I've worked in the area of discrimination. Uh, I've been involved particularly from the women's rights point of view in, in, in relation to all the things that Hillary has mentioned the way uh, stereotypes work, the way uh, there's an inbuilt advantage from one group uh, to another. And what's happened for me, I think, is suddenly realizing that in this position as a, a, as a white woman, um, I'm slightly on the other side of the argument. And I think the recognition of my privilege and the, the recognition of the fact that the assumption that we we just take for granted that the world looks white and that the the way we conduct the way we conduct our lives here is the natural way um it's something i've been obviously focused on because we've worked so much internationally but i think it's brought home very much to me that it's not good enough for us just to acknowledge how terrible it is uh, what's happened we actually also have to accept our responsibility in that as well as and recognize the privileges which maybe we don't always feel but which come from being in the the majority culture if you like or the privileged culture um in, it, in our society it's, been, it's a really important point and you know it's been a time of really um a lot of deeper personal dialogues with um uh, not just friends and and confidants but also you know our clients and CEOs with business leaders because the spectrum of evidence that came out during the course of these two weeks between the New York Central Park incident all the way through the George Floyd murder really gives you an, the full range of what you're describing, Cherie, where that cloak of privilege, sometimes when you don't even know you're wearing it, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the, the uh, bias, the privilege, the race card that we can all pull um, if and when we want to. It's been um, important. And I do think that the first step to changing any of our behaviors is to change and it, yourself. And that first step of acknowledging and awareness. So I, I love all of the um, uh, book lists and other things that are going around to start with awareness. You know, watching a film like 13th, reading White Fragility, going back and looking at why uh, the BBC documentary, why the UK will never have a black prime minister. Maybe we will or maybe we won't, but the question is what structural bias is there? And the second commonality between the points that um, you were both making, uh, Cherie and, and Hillary, if I could, it is that it's not good enough just to feel it personally. You know, neutral is actually not neutral. You can't be on the fence when it comes to anti-racism. You can't be on the fence when it comes to actively working towards a more equal society for women and technology, for blacks and other underrepresented groups. And that shift that neutral is not neutral, whether individually or for my business, I think could be one of the biggest positive things that comes out of this. At least that's my hope. I hope um, so too, but I think we have to act together. I mean, you know, the, the danger of all this, of course, is that it will be, and there are people who would really like to make this a polarizing issue. And it's absolutely vital. Polarize that we, and that, or go away. <laughs> yes. And it's really vital that we actually stand up together and side by side say, we have to change things and, uh, you know, let, let's, let's get on with it and see what we can do now, today, and then going forward in the long term. We can do something every day if we want to. It's Vivian, just a question. Yeah. Vivian, Please, can I Hillary. Just add to what Cherie just said? We, we also have to do a better job of making the case that progress, advancement in human rights and women's rights and civil rights is not a zero sum game. It's because someone else gets to advance because they have the kind of education they deserve to have, they have the health care they deserve to have, they have the economic opportunities they deserve to have, doesn't take away from those who currently have it. I mean, one of our big problems in the United States right now is that for too long, um, our political 
divisiveness has been really rooted in the fear among many people, predominantly white people, that if others advance, that must mean they will regress. And you know, with technology today, that is absolutely not the case. And it should be true even without technology, but the advances in technology connect you around the world, give you an opportunity to be more entrepreneurial, more philanthropical, more creative, and it's not taking away from someone else. So in addition to the point that Cherie and you made, Vivian, I think we've got to do a better job in our politics. You saw it in Brexit, I saw it in the 2016 election, where it really was divide and conquer. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're feeling stifled or stagnant, or you're worried about your children's advancement, that's somebody else's problem. So you've got to stop somebody else uh, in order for you to go further. And we've got to we've mm -hmm. got to crash through that kind of mentality. And, and part of the, I mean, the great training that the law provides, and in McKinsey, you know, our version of that is the analysis. You know, what do the facts tell us? What does the data say? It doesn't tell you what to do policy-wise, but it does give you a starting point. Is that you can actually make that case with evidence that is backed up with um, uh, economic as well as social impact so that you don't have to guess at what the benefit is as you tailor it to different contexts and that it's not exactly, as you say, Hillary, a zero-sum game. The world, uh, was that quote from Hamilton, the world is wide enough um, <laughs> and the pie will grow and everything positive in terms of access to women's rights and human rights, you know, is correlated with broader economic development. Now, for women, but, 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 I but, 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 but Vivian, you know, th th this is this is something. It's really important to understand that we can't all be the same, and this is why diversity is the key. You know, the the answer to this is not that everybody becomes the same. I mean, I think back to the eighties when I was a young, in, you know, the seventies and eighties when I was a young woman lawyer trying to, from a working class background, trying to make it in the man's public school world of the law, and at that time. All I wanted to do was, you know, I just thought I just have to do everything they're doing, but I have to do it better and in the same way, you know, and yeah, that's a zero sum game. You know, actually, we need to create the environment, we need to create the businesses, we need to create the politics where it's about allowing people to be the, themselves and celebrate the differences because it's as all the research that you've done in McKinsey shows, isn't it? It's the different mindsets, the different experiences, the, uh, the different points of view that make for a more creative, uh, responsive, fairer society. It's also a more um, productive and um, um, healthier economically society. So it's also better for the economics as well as the, the social side. And it's really important to keep those two things joined up. I always think about the women's challenge as having four frames. You know, one is very clearly about um, health and safety, just physical safety, which of course is still not guaranteed for some women, you know, so many of which with you both work with in your foundations and initiatives globally. Econ economy, you know, women at work, because uh, most of us have jobs we want but need to work as well. Social and healthcare access, which COVID is laying bare for all of us to see that the inequalities particularly for women and other um, underrepresented groups uh, mean that you don't have an even starting point if you don't have the same access to health and social care. And then of course the law, you know, we're fortunate in the UK and US to have um, a closer parity in parliamentary and legal access. But both of you know that if the law is not on your side, like the policing examples that you're giving earlier, uh, Hillary, that you face, um, you know, a huge mountain to climb even if you're competitive in other areas. So that structured frame through which you can look at any group of women in the workforce, any group of entrepreneurs, any group of people is really helpful because it allows us to sort of take actions and make plans. But I think if um, we're making those plans, Vivian, we've got to take into account at the moment when we're talking about how we're gonna get out of this, that women are already behind. And if we don't make specific provision to ensure that they don't fall further behind because of what's happening, uh, then uh, you know it, it's not it's it's not good enough. And one of the problems I think is that maybe inclusion and diversity has been falling down the agenda, and we have to ensure 
uh, that that keeps up the agenda. Are there things that you think, um, Hillary, we have to to um, do to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, I want to start with a comment that you made uh, just a minute or so ago, uh, Vivian, when you were talking about the uh, the process that you use uh, as an analyst, uh, looking at facts, looking at evidence, because there is running underneath these large social and economic uh, changes, a real commitment on the part of some to undermine uh, a fact-based uh, decision-making uh, process, to mm. dismiss science and evidence. We saw a lot of that during this uh, terrible pandemic, where we had government officials uh, from the very top denying the science, uh, distorting the science, uh, dismissing uh, the science. So we can't make the progress that we're hoping for in bringing people together to become problem solvers, particularly on behalf of women and other you know, marginalized groups, if we can't agree on the importance of evidence-based uh, decision-making. So we've got to stand up for science, facts, and evidence if we expect mm -hmm. to move uh, the agenda forward. But I agree with Shereen's point that COVID uh, has the potential of pushing women back, uh, turning the clock back. You know, in my country, uh, most of the frontline healthcare workers are women. Most of those who lost their jobs in low paying service sector uh, work are women. Actually, a higher percentage of the unemployed now are women. And with the closure of childcare and schools in uh, the United States, many of us are worrying uh, that it will be difficult for mothers to go back to work. And we're already seeing a lot of anecdotal evidence where there's no place to leave your children or uh, there are understandable worries about leaving your children uh, in a childcare facility. Um, the domestic workforce has been decimated, and there's concern about rehiring uh, child care workers, elder care workers. So we're putting uh, a, a lot of the burden on recovering from COVID uh, on the backs of mothers and caregivers. And mm -hmm. if it's true in the United States, I'm sure it's uh, much truer in many parts of the world because we're, again, beginning to see uh, some families deciding they can't afford those girl children. So maybe they didn't want to uh, give them as child brides, but right now it makes more economic sense to do so because the economy is down and on and on we go. Uh, so we're, I think, talking about this issue at a really timely moment because we have to, number one, raise it. We have to keep talking about it, that women cannot bear the disproportionate burden of the global economy recovering from COVID. Governments need to step in. Businesses need to be more uh, sensitive to their women employees, uh, providing more opportunities to continue uh, teleworking or other ways trying to recreate employment. Uh, but we're going to have to pay extra special attention uh, to women and girls as we hopefully uh, begin to turn the corner in many parts of the world, but by no means not all, on the virus and then try to rebuild the economy. It has to be a conscious choice for businesses, yeah. conscious choice for, for governments. Um, but but I Vivian, Vivian the I just want to say that the truth is that it's already, it's already been difficult for women's economic empowerment. If you look at the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, then yeah. last year, in 2019, the last report it did when it looked at uh, equality between men and women in, in health, education, politics, and the economy, the one area where things have gone backwards and not forwards was actually women's participation in the economy. And from 2018 to 2019, it actually had gone back by 55 years. So now they're saying it's going to take 257 years for women to have that equal access to the economic opportunities that we all need, which is not only complete economic nonsense, because I know in McKinsey and some of the research you've done, you have identified uh, the trillions of dollars that 
could be added to the global economy if women were given that equal access. But it, 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 it's also obviously a, a, an issue of, of basic justice. And part of that, you know, is about the stereotypes about what a woman's role is. And I think if, they're, if you don't actively, it comes back to this point about being neutral, doesn't it? If we assume that we're going to retain the progress that women have in many contexts made, but number one, that it is parity, because it's not yet parity. We're not yet at parity with men in terms of access to all of the opportunities around business, employment, skills, safety. And secondly, if we assume that it's going to just stay the same, we're going to be in for a very... Um, unwelcome surprise because unmanaged we know it will regress and I do think we see that already um, and that's why we're encouraging um, like a lot of our clients to focus not just on rebuilding their business and rebuilding jobs but particularly starting with the most vulnerable jobs because if you go after the most vulnerable jobs you'll also be supporting the most vulnerable people and that is what their communities need and increasingly uh, what business leaders are, are certainly making a lot of commitments to do um, and we're going to hold them to that. Um, one of the biggest um, uh, differences in my uh, career so far was, you know, the times when I had a sort of a coach or a mentor, a colleague who gave me a little bit of encouragement, normally just to, to push ahead and not mind the rules so much um, and push ahead with either ideas and analysis or ideas with clients, but to sort of have higher ambition and be confident about going after it. And sometimes that quiet word, as we say in the UK in your ear, made a big difference. I know that the two of you met, you know, many years ago um, in similar yet very different circumstances. And I, and I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about how your uh, mentor and sponsorship relationship uh, uh, formed when you were both, I think, first ladies when you met uh, many years ago. Well, I looked, Hillary was so amazing to me, both actually whilst my husband was leader of the opposition and then uh, when when he became prime minister, you and Bill were the first people really that that came to see us in 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 uh, in Ten Downing Street and and I and then remember I came to the White House and you took me around and showed me your office and all the things that you had achieved at that time and I always remember you saying to me, you know, Cherie, you're not going to be able to please all the people all the time because there are people who doesn't have anything to do with you. They're just not going to like what you represent um, and that you had to you told me you've just got to be true to yourself and and and, and stick to your your convictions and that has always um stayed with me and uh gave me confidence to do all sorts of things that uh, maybe i wouldn't have done otherwise well so i'm so I'm, grateful <laughs> i am i am um incredibly um grateful for and delighted by my long friendship with Cherie. And I, I have to say, she did something that has never been done in the United States uh, and, and had never been done before in the uh, U.S. That was to continue her work. Uh, and I was in awe of that. The <laughs> fact that she could uh, not only take on the public uh, responsibilities as well as the private supportive responsibility as the spouse of a uh, government leader, but also continuing her law practice and making it very clear uh, that she was going to do it. Uh, and yeah, there were some rocky uh, you know, roads uh, along that journey, but I was so admiring of her fortitude and her commitment and her determination to you know, continue the work that meant so much to her. Uh, so I saw in her uh, a real role model for many, many uh, women who find themselves, maybe not in the exact position, but, but similar ones, and, and just as she is saying, I was so fortunate along many of my life's uh, pathways to have women who did uh, the same for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, I remember uh, when I was elected to the United States Senate, a, a very unlikely uh, career choice for a, a first lady at, at the time. Uh, the several of the experienced veteran women uh, senators stepped in with great advice and mentoring, uh, in particular, two of them, Barbara Mikulski, who I think the morning after I won, called me and said, okay, you've won. Now you got to learn how to be a senator, and I'm going to help you. And uh, 
Senator Dianne Feinstein, who um, also was a source of, you know, continuing uh, advice and guidance. I just can't overstate how important that is, Vivian, to, you know, you, you need your friends, uh, you need the family support when you're venturing forth into uh, uh, new territory, so to speak. Uh, but you also need people who can reach back down and say, okay, here's how I did it, or here, learn from what I did, or frankly, from the mistakes that I made. Um, and that's true, not just in government politics and the law, but in business and academia and the media and every other uh, kind of uh, economic endeavor. There's I, a, would a say, I, 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 I would say that a number of my mentors, certainly in the law, were actually men. Mm -hmm. um, men who were prepared to actually uh, act as my sponsor and bring me into things and recommend me. Um, and uh, that's why actually, because we have a global mentoring platform in my foundation, and I was always very keen, and we still do, make, making sure that though we mentor uh, women entrepreneurs, that we have men and women who are the mentors. So the mentees may be women, but the men and women, because uh, this is not just something that women need to do for each other, though we do, but it's also something that uh, anybody uh, can, can, be a, can be a mentor. It doesn't have and to be the same sex. Could I just yeah, add, I, quickly, could I just add please, to that? Please. Of course, you know, I, I also have had the same experience as Cherie, but I've also had the experience as uh, an employer of a lot of uh, men and women uh, over the course now of uh, a lot of different uh, jobs. And I have found that it's uh, really important when you uh, employ young men to point out to them uh, their own preconceptions or stereotypes. Uh, when I was Secretary of State, for example, I wanted very much to highlight uh, the support of women's uh, rights and opportunities uh, around the world as part of American foreign policy. And when I began, clearly there was some eye rolling uh, from some of the men uh, who were uh, in the foreign service or political appointees. And so I took the time literally to mentor them and to take them to places when I would travel. I wouldn't just meet with heads of state. I would go meet with village women or women who were involved in self-empowerment organizations like the Self-Employment Women's Association of India and others. And I would bring those young men in particular, and I would say, I want you to hear these women's stories because the more women are involved, the more they have autonomy over the decisions that they make in their families, in their communities, in their countries, the stabler these countries are. And that Absolutely. is important for our own national security. So it's not some you know, nice thing that I do on the side. I consider it central to what we are doing. And then the final point I wanted to make was it, in mentoring both young men and particularly young women, um, I often had the experience where I would say to a young woman, you know, you've done a great job. I'd like to promote you. I'd like to give you additional responsibility. And all mm -hmm. too often, the response was, do you think I'm ready? When I would mm -hmm. say that to a young man, they might not explicitly say it, but the response was, well, what took you so long? Mm -hmm. So part of it is raising the expectations and aspirations of both the young men, but in particular, the young women who work for you. Well, we, oh, have, a huge, we have a huge global audience watching this today. And I, I love the notion that sister to sister works, particularly when we're 50% of the population, 50% of the entrepreneurs, you know, we can, really help each other but allies you know in you know like-minded um, men who just want high performance and great outcomes for their businesses and doing the right thing at work men don't want that any different than women um, but that can make a huge difference but we have to expect not only excellence from ourselves in service and in our professional lives but expect it from others but we should have the highest ambition for ourselves sherry you were saying I was going to say, I think that what Hillary says is so right, and it's about women's confidence level. You know, women often don't have the confidence to put themselves forward, and that's why actually uh, it is important to take that into account and to design programs which aren't just about business skills or you know the, the technical competences, but also to recognise the reality of, of a woman's life, whether it's 
in a, in a society which doesn't necessarily value women equally as men. And certainly in the work that we're doing in Africa and in Asia and uh, in Latin America, you know, women aren't always valued as equally as and men. That's a big so part society of is telling you you're not worthy. And so from I know, the you beginning, have to not listen to you have to listen yeah. to your inner voice and the people who care and are mentors who love and care for you as mentors professionally as well as personally. Um, and that is really a big part of the 100,000 Women campaign, Cherie, that we were speaking about a little bit earlier in the green room. Yeah, absolutely, because this is one of the things that we are trying to do because in the work we've been doing with women entrepreneurs, we have taken that context, we've devised programs, we've used technology to deliver, yes, the training and skills and the knowledge, but also through our networks and our mentoring to help build up those other skills, those other, the, the idea of a confidence, the idea that you are worthy, the idea that you can do it, and all the things that go together to make uh, someone a successful person. And so we've already done that with 160,000 women over the last 12 years, and Hillary was very involved when we launched the, the foundation. And now for the next three years, we aim to do, go even more ambitious and raise 10 million pounds to reach 100,000 women. Because, you know, Fantastic. that's still a drop in the ocean uh, and we still need to do more. But, but it's real progress. Now, Hillary, you've done something that I'm not sure I can do, which is you've co-authored a book with your daughter. <laughs> and it's called, it's called Gutsy Women. And, um, I just wonder, are, are there gutsy choices that you're planning to make in the future? Uh, I hope so, Vivian. I, I hope I'm not done with making gutsy choices. Uh, sometimes I feel like I make a you know pretty normal choice and people view it as gutsy. So I, I don't know, I have to keep working on that. Uh, you know, the, writing the book with Chelsea was a, a, a real joy personally, but it was also an eye opener because um, we come from different generations. We had different experiences. Uh, a lot of the women that I, you know, put on my list, because we had lots of hundreds and hundreds of women that we could have uh, included. And in fact, we wrote profiles of 200 and then dropped it down to 100 to actually get it in the book. But they were, they were different. She had different um, choices than I did based mm -hmm. on um, how she perceived women who we said were gutsy, not just because they were um, promoting themselves or overcoming their own personal obstacles, although that's a precondition, but because they went on to do it for others. They were trying to open doors for others. They were trying to change systems for others. And I, I just wanna make sure that what Cherie and I just said is, is put into a larger sort of system context, if I could, Vivian, because there still are systemic barriers to even the most confident, most mm -hmm. excellently performing woman because of these deeply held views that sometimes we don't even know we have. So for example, um, some recent psychological research, which was fascinating to me, handed mm -hmm. a resume that was exactly the same on qualifications and experience to a group of people to test their reactions only one resume was John's and one was John was Jane's. So that was the only difference. The name was male or the name was female. And based on reading the resume, people had reactions. Like, oh, I'm mm -hmm. not sure I'd like her. Or, I, I, you know, she sounds kind of aggressive to go from that job to that job. Mm -hmm. All of these built in um, reflexes almost. And then another fascinating study was done when orchestras were challenged in the United States that they didn't have enough women musicians. And they said, oh, we try to find them, we just can't find them. So they moved toward blind auditions. So mm. there was a screen and behind the screen, the musician played. They made their judgment before they pulled the curtain to see whether it was a man or a woman. So they made it on the basis of the music musicality. I mentioned mm -hmm. those two studies and there are reams more, as you both know. So it's not just that we want to build women's confidence. That's an absolute condition. You've got to be prepared. You have to be educated and informed. You have to practice. You need mentors. You need all kinds of you know, skills that really provide the base for your confidence. But we also have to break down the systemic barriers that still stand in the way 
of people thinking about including women. And some of those are still literally structural, legal, regulatory in the countries where uh, Sheree works and where you have worked as well, Vivian, where you see, uh, you know, there are laws against women having certain jobs and mm -hmm. against inheriting certain property and all the rest of it. But in advanced societies like yours and mine, uh, there are still all of these other uh, internal, so shall we say internal psychological and cultural mm -hmm. uh, barriers to really giving women the same opportunity. And to go back quickly to what Cherie was talking about, the, uh, the Davos mm -hmm. study and the great McKinsey work that you all have done, if we remove the barriers from every economy across the world, every economy's growth would go up. So maybe Absolutely. you don't have to remove so many barriers in the UK or the US, but there are still barriers. Um, and you remove even more barriers in the Middle East or Africa or Asia. So when people make this argument that, you know, we gotta get the economy going and we'll worry about women later, they're undercutting the real potential for economic growth that would lift everybody. So there's, there's a lot uh, to unpack here. Well, and the, and the opportunity is that we can rebuild better and fix it in a different way, both because the economics require it, our healthcare and social system requires it, and also our justice and equality system, because this moment that we're in, as we said right at the beginning, has laid bare the so many different versions of structural inequality. Homeschooling, there's a digital divide. You know, middle class or more affluent families might have the technology. Other families have one smartphone that they're sharing across uh, multiple household members and the adults have priority because they need it for work. So when you say stay home and homeschool right there, you already have uneven starting places. And those simple studies um, that frankly uh, resonate, the change in name, the objective music, the simple things that you would do if you couldn't see behind the curtain show us that the bias is still there. Um, and we will, uh, I know we're all, all three of us are gonna continue to advocate for the system changes that are needing. It's not good enough to be um, a good person and not to be neutral or to do things individually. We really have to fix systems so that all of the women who, and men who are watching this session today, as well as hoping to join the world of work, whether moving from a village with a skill and starting a business all the way through to graduating from some of the premier universities around the world. Um, now, I know that we could continue chatting for the rest of the afternoon. And anytime you have a conversation amongst friends, and my um, father for sure would have said a conversation between women, we can go on. But I know there are more people in our audience who have questions besides just me. So I don't want to be selfish. I want to give our, our audience um, a chance to ask um, each of you a few questions and, um, and just really look forward to, to your response. We've particularly chosen a few female entrepreneurs and leaders um, so that you could hear their voices. We have four questions. Our first question is from Martha McCarty. Hello, my name is Martha. I'm from South East London and I'm a first year politics student at Durham University. Technology in education is a hot topic right now and one I'm particularly interested in. To what extent do you think technology, for example, online degrees, can help empower disadvantaged women? Well, I'm so grateful for that great question because it plays absolutely into uh, the heart of what my foundation has all been about. Look, it all started with me being in 10 Downing Street and being able to go and have tea with the first lady of Tanzania and at the same time continue to work as a, as a lawyer. Why? Because I had access to technology and I wanted to see whether I could use that power of technology to help women in other countries where they didn't have, they weren't as privileged as we were. And that's how we started with our training program that we deliver. We deliver some training over the mobile phone, which is much more accessible to a wider range of, of people. And we also uh, deliver training over the internet. And in this COVID crisis, we have discovered how important it is and how lucky we've been able to be to pivot to actually address those issues. So for example, just in the last few months, we consulted mm. with the women we were working with and discovered that what they really wanted was some courses about resilience and how could they adapt their businesses 
and thanks to help from Cambridge Wireless and King's College London and, and others, we have been able to put together a course which we just launched last week. Uh, a Fantastic. resilience It's a resilience course about what can you do when your business is, faces a crisis like this. A plan, if you follow the bite-sized uh, modules, you come up with a 90-day uh, plan for your business. And already in a week, we've had a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand women sign up for that course and 4,000 uh, just look at it. It's a, free, it's a free course. We've changed, we've made available the, the courses we're doing online. Um, so that people can come to our website even if they weren't originally on our courses and see some of the programs that we were delivering um, remotely to, to the women we were working with. We've, we've um, joined it's the School really of adaptive. Marketing. Yeah, we've <laughs> joined the School of Marketing and made those uh, marketing courses available online. The 600 people, again, uh, have, have already taken uh, those up. But, you know, we have to remember, of course, that access, as you said, to digital isn't uh, isn't uh, all good. There is this huge gender gap, uh, and in fact, one of the first reports that my uh, foundation did was to look back in 2010 with the GSMA on whether there was a global gender gap uh, in in lower middle income countries between men and women's access to the mobile phone. And guess what? Of course, there was. And as a result of that, we identified um, an opportunity for the industry. Uh, to be able to reach a, a new uh, market, and, and that's gone from strength to strength. We also know, of course, that not everyone has access to the internet. And when you talk about Even. Uh, people sharing phones, I mean, often in many places, it's the man who gets the first uh, chance of the data, and, and not the and not 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 the women. So we're we're doing all of all all of that. And uh, one of the practical things we've done with the program we're doing with the women in Oaxaca, uh, which is in Mexico, which we work with women around the dump there. We were delivering in our one-stop shop there access to training in a, in, a, in a community center where they would come because the women didn't necessarily have the access to the internet. Obviously that had to I stop the, because I, of it. And so well, what I we've done is we've provided them. them yeah, no, we've provided I love the them pragmatism with of those three. examples, um, Cherie, yeah. because they make a concrete difference. It's all, almost like you spot the macro trend, and then you yeah. put in really practical solutions to to close the digital gap in you know business or education. Absolutely, um, I think it's pretty our, feminine. <laughs> I, I think that's right. I think that's right. But it just shows you that the concrete steps make a big difference, and then yeah. scaling it. Now, I'm going to start with you for the next uh, question. Um, we have uh, Deborah O'Kinla. Hi there, my name is Deborah. I'm the founder of YSYS, which stands for Your Startup, Your Story. We're a startup community for diverse talent and we build and design entrepreneurship and employment programs. My question is, what can we do to ensure that when pushing forward gender equality programs, we are thinking about it through intersectional lenses and including black women and brown women in the conversation? You have to, you, you have to think uh, about, about that. And, you know, uh, to me, it, it is just inadequate uh, to target only one group and not to include diversity from the very beginning of your uh, endeavor. And I love the idea that you're on a platform uh, because you can tell stories from everywhere and you can partner with groups like uh, Cherie's Foundation so that mm -hmm. more of the stories that she has can be supplied to you and the diversity of the voices telling those stories about their startups will in turn encourage more people. And so, it, it, you know, the term intersectionality sometimes gets, you know, pushed to the side because people say, what does that mean? You know, an intersection is where two roads meet. Well, you know, they don't understand uh, what the whole point of it is, which is, yes, you're a woman, you may also be a black woman or a brown woman or an Asian woman. You may be gay or straight or bi or trans. You may be uh, whatever religious uh, belief or whatever national background. I mean, you are an amalgam of your identities and to try to split one off and only address you as a piece of that identity does a real disservice, not only to you, but also to the larger cause. And I think Vivian's been eloquent uh, in our conversation talking about how diversity and inclusivity 
is really what we should be seeking, not because we're nice people and it's a nice thing to do, although I think it is, but because it works better. Diverse groups make better decisions. Diverse Great corporations point. make more money. I mean, whatever the measurement is, thinking about diversity uh, will actually prove to be um, a better outcome for you in whatever you're doing. And so many of our audience today are also founders. They're women who already are geek girls. You know, They want to start businesses. They want to be owners. They want to uh, have equity. Uh, they want everything that comes with being in the probably biggest mo moment of our time. We will hopefully find um, a vaccine that is at scale, affordable, and sustainable, inshallah. But when we have that, we're still going to have technology. We're still going to have the environmental challenge. We're still going to have inequality. And a lot of our audience today are people and uh, founders and female founders who want to be able to make those decisions. And so I also challenge female founders to remember you're shaping your business from the beginning. You, know, you too have to choose diversity and build in those principles because if you have it at the beginning, you'll have it at the end. And, uh, and you frankly, even in tech, you see big differences in the philosophy and platforms and choices that different tech companies are, are making and gratefully that their uh, customers uh, are holding them accountable for, employees are holding them accountable for. Now, I'd like each of you to um, uh, answer the next two questions. Um, the next one comes in from Tanya Bowler. Hi, I'm Tanya Bowler and I started LV. We make smarter tech for women, such as a smart, discreet, wearable breast pump, so women can go back to work and continue being the parent they want to be. And yet we all know that when it comes to women and parenthood, we are far from equitable in terms of shared parental leave and shared parental responsibility. And it looks like lockdown has made things worse. In your opinion, what can we do to really get to a more equitable place in terms of shared parental leave, shared parental responsibility, so that women can have the careers they deserve and be the parents and women that they want to? Thank you. We'll start with you, Cherie. Well, I'm so glad that uh, Tanya's asked that question because you know, you're know you absolutely right about her business. Her business is about femtech. It goes right to the heart of, of, of being a woman. So, I mean, the, 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 the pelvic support technology that she has for women after childbirth, you know, would a man think of that? And I love the breast pump as well, by the way. Uh, it takes me back to when I had the old manual breast pump. I used to sit in chambers with my door closed, hoping no one would come in as I was, <laughs> as I was trying to pump I some to, milk. I used to hide down. We used to have those half frosted glasses, you know, just like yeah. you see in office. <laughs> I would get down <laughs> below the frosting. <laughs> This, but this breast pump, you just stick under your jumper and it doesn't No, it's jog. very discreet. <laughs> it's great to So yeah, so, you know, amazing, amazing practical idea. So thank you for that. And of course, not surprising that you're asking me about uh, parental leave and shared parenting. Uh, it's something I feel so passionately about. This is not a woman's issue. All of us, men and women, are parents of our children and our children deserve uh, input from both parents, which will help them in their turn become rounded people with two role models and not, and not a distorted view about the role of, of men and women. We have made a move in the UK um, in relation to that, in that we have now moved away from just the idea of maternity leave to the idea of shared parental leave. We're not doing as much as many other places in Europe are doing. But this is the direction to go. And obviously things were different when I was a, uh, when I was a young parent myself. But what, I, what I'm proud to say is I see so much how both my sons, well, I've got three, but he's only 20. So I'm hoping he's not having a baby anytime soon. But my <laughs> two sons who are fathers are very hands-on with their parenting care um, and, and do a lot of, about that. And for my eldest son, who's got this six-month-old son of his own, the fact that he's been working for home, from home for these last four months has made a huge difference to the way he can support his wife, who actually is a, uh, in, in the tech industry herself, and, and have this great relationship with his child, which is what he wanted, and which will actually working from home enable. So it's so important. Fantastic. I'm so glad you raised that question. It's amazing how these sons choose these really dynamic, high-powered women. Interesting. Hilary, your perspective. 
Well, I will echo everything that Cherie said. Um, you know, there, there needs to be uh, a real push for parental leave. Uh, you know, we are still fighting for paid leave in the United States. We have mm -hmm. something that is called family leave, which started when my husband was president, but it was unpaid. It was the best we could get at the time, and it was considered revolutionary then. But we now know so much more about what we should be doing and how we should be working. And so parental leave would make a huge difference. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of it, again, goes to the economy. We know that people who are worried about their children, people who have to give up, uh, you know, day-to-day -day care too soon because they have got to get back to work because they don't have any paid leave, you know, that is not a good employment uh, atmosphere, and it isn't the best way to create product productivity. So I think you can make the case that it's not only the right thing to do to support uh, parenting between both mothers and fathers, but it, in the long run, is the right thing for our economy and our society as well. Well, and I do think the COVID-19 uh, moment, particularly for a lot of families when we've been um, you know, at different points in the world, you know, uh, obviously the economy is uh, gradually starting to open up as we learn new habits. And you can see some places like New Zealand and in Asia quite far along and others behind. But that moment, I think it's been, it's been a big personal and domestic moment for, for our family as well. And you could take it in a humorous way about my teenage boys learning chores and things that they probably should have known before, all the way through to the mindset that they'll have when they think about what really is the best way to return to work and reopen offices and re-engage. And so, you know, there are, the COVID experience has got a lot of big positive lessons for us as well, if we've got the courage to take them on. And the UK um, shared parental leave, the gender pay gap as a mandatory uh, recommendation for businesses and so forth has really led the way in using the power of um, standards, the law sometimes or other operating standards and then scaling them. and. Uh, that then, you know, a little bit like anti-smoking legislation sets the touch paper that then changes a lot of practice. And, and we can have that kind of change out of COVID as well. Now we've got one question left. You've both been very generous with your time, but I don't want to miss the chance to have our last questioner um, um, ask each of you uh, the uh, things that are on her mind. Um, her name is uh, Anne and she's age 10. My name is Anne. I am in year five at Starksfield Primary School in Enfield, supported by Teach First. I would like to ask Sherry and Hilary what tips they would give girls to help us plan our futures. Well, what, 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 I, would, what I would say is it's lovely to hear from you, Anne. And you know, when I was 14, which is not that much older than you, I told everyone that I was going to be uh, the first British woman prime minister. Um, so I had big ambitions. I didn't quite make that, but I did get to number 10 Downing Street, which just goes to show how you can't always plan for what life may throw at you. But what I do know is that we have to have, as, as Hilary has said, the courage to believe in ourselves and to, to seize the future, to change the future, to make that world which allows us all, girls of 10 and girls in their 60s, like, me and you <laughs> to to define their future and and to reach their dreams and to have no barriers to stop them to do that and for boys too of course hillary well and thank you for um asking uh your question and in addition to what sheree said um i would ask you to please take your education seriously uh, learn as much as you can in school, find opportunities out of school to uh, learn from people not like yourself, uh, get involved with some kind of service project to help your community, uh, provide uh, support to uh, groups that uh, might need your energy and your uh, enthusiasm. Uh, I think you should also um, Practice being both brave and kind. Uh, you know, when I think about how people go through life and uh, how they get knocked down, and that will happen to all of us, Anne. Uh, it doesn't matter who we are or where we're from or what station in life, any of that. 
everybody gets knocked down. And what you need is to really get back up and keep going when those disappointments and setbacks happen to you. I've never met any leader uh, anywhere, man or woman, uh, who wasn't resilient. That's a big word, but it's a word that I want you to really think about uh, because we want you and every little girl like you and every little boy, uh, but particularly young girls right now, uh, to practice being brave and kind so that you can be resilient and you can decide what you want to do in your life and pursue it to the best of your ability and the utmost of your effort because you can't always count on getting there. As Cherie mm -hmm. said, she had one idea when she was a little girl. She didn't get that, but she got a lot of other really important <laughs> and good things done in her life. And so you can't plan, but a good education and developing your own resilience, your own bravery and your kindness uh, will put you in good stead no matter where life takes you. And, and we do spend a lot of time, um, Anne, at Teach First working exactly on that. Of course, you have to do your academics and your coursework. Hillary, Cherie, and I all agree on that, but you also have to work on your communication skills, your confidence, your ability to try new things, um, to really just have a set of life skills that are um, complementary to the, the academic work that you'll do, and then a little bit of bravery. You just have to try things sometimes, and don't worry if it doesn't work out, because we know that if you try again with support from your friends and family in school, you're gonna achieve your dreams. I wanna thank you, Anne, for your question. It really is the right note to end on looking towards the future. And um, it's your future really, and the future of the female entrepreneurs and other technology leaders that are on the call today that this conversation is about to give you some insight from two of the most uh, inspiring and um, uh, grounded uh, working women in the world. Um, and also hopefully give you um, some ideas that you can apply practically at this really unique moment. We are for sure in a moment of really pivotal change regarding our, our lives as we think about recovering together and correctly from the uh, COVID health crisis, our livelihoods as we recover from the largest simultaneous economic shock any of us will see in our lifetimes, and our liberties. You know, are we going to build a world in which we're aware of and directly addressing bias against women, bias against black and other underrepresented groups. And I know so many in our audience today see in you, um, Secretary Clinton and Mrs. Blair, Hillary and Cherie, as we all say, <laughs> we see in you examples, not only of women who've done that with their careers and lives, but also who are works in progress and have so much more to give, really the definition of gutsy women. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank Accelerate Her for hosting such a dynamic panel and London Tech Week for going virtual. It was required because of the moment we're in, but you've done it extraordinarily well. Thank you again for joining. I now wanna welcome back Laura Stebbing, the CEO of Accelerate Her. Thank you so much, Dame Vivian, Secretary Clinton and Cherie Blair for joining us. What an incredibly inspiring session. We really could have gone on for hours. Thank you also to everyone listening in. Please stick around for our last session of the day, a crucially important panel bringing together influential leaders in the black tech and business community to discuss what we as the tech industry can and should be doing to dismantle the systemic racism that pervades our society and to create a new paradigm for equal access to opportunity.